Welcome to the Physique Development Muscle Series. In this special series, we're breaking down the science and art of training each muscle group. Each episode is dedicated to a specific muscle, providing you with expert insight into its function, dispelling common training misconceptions, and highlighting our go-to exercises that deliver results. We'll also share key execution cues to help you perfect your technique and maximize your gains. Get ready to elevate your training game and achieve your fitness goals like never before. Let's dive into hamstrings. As we come to an end of our guest episodes, although we still have a few more Muscle Series episodes, so stay tuned for that, it is my pleasure to have Cody McBroom join in on our conversation today. Cody is the founder and CEO of Tailored Coaching Method, and he understands that every individual is unique, different, and deserves a specifically tailored approach that's backed by science. Cody has been coaching for over a decade and has a myriad of certifications, his CISSN, his NASM CPT, his MNU certification, his NCI certification, and Precision Nutrition Level 2 Cert. I've had the pleasure of knowing Cody personally for years and have always appreciated our conversations. He is the host of the Tailored Life podcast that has over a thousand episodes and just recently rebranded it to the Choose Hard podcast. Cody said that Nike has their slogan, just do it, and his is Choose Hard. That's what she said. So it just felt right to have it. He has competed in bodybuilding shows, trained CrossFit seriously, done countless photo shoot preps and everything in between. So he knows a thing or two about developing a great set of hamstrings. Give a warm welcome to Cody McBroom. Cody, it is great to have you on the podcast today. How has your day been so far? It's been good, man. It's a little earlier my time <laughs> compared to you. So, um, but it's good, dude. Uh, the only thing I can complain about is it's, it's raining still. And it's June, what is this, June 27th. We still got rain over here, man. It's terrible. It's been it's been raining a ton here as well. It it sucks the energy desire to do anything out of me. As soon as it's raining, I just want to be able to cuddle up and do nothing. And then I have the last two days, my days have been action packed. So it's been a grind to get through my normal day. Dude, I feel you. It is the same way for me. Uh, I'm hoping we move somewhere sunny uh, eventually. So that's the plan. So hopefully we'll be not somewhere where it's raining all the time. And uh, yeah, I don't know when for sure, but we're we're looking to do it. So it'll, okay. it'll happen sooner than later. Well, that's exciting. I'm excited for you guys. Yeah. In today's episode, we're gonna dig into all things hamstrings, what you have done to grow your hamstrings, to get them just absolutely hanging. What have you done with, with clients? Um, and I'm excited to dig in. The first question I'd like to bring to you is going to be, what are your favorite hamstring exercises? Man, this one was tough too. And I love this topic because when I actually started in the industry, I mean, I was 18 years old. Yeah, I was 18 years old. I got a, uh, an internship and started coaching after that. But it was at a, a strength facility that was very heavy, like athlete focused. Even with their gen pop, they took like an athlete's mindset. So as you can imagine, I mean, anybody listening who looks at, uh, especially like a guy because guys don't typically, unless you're a bodybuilder need to bring up your hamstrings, guys don't typically focus on glutes and hamstrings. You know, they usually look at the mirror muscles. And, uh, but if you look at a, a baseball player or a football player that's wearing baseball or football pants that are a little bit tight, their butt and their, their hamstrings are so big always. Right. Or like, if you ever get, you're in a wedding with a guy who's a clear athlete, like a college athlete, he's wearing a tux and it just doesn't fit. Um, so anyway, I, I came into the industry around all that. So our training was so posterior chain dominant all the time, um, which is, it, it was tough, like answering this a little bit because from a bodybuilding lens, and especially with all the science that's coming out, I was trying to focus on that versus my own past experience when I was very hamstring and posterior chain focused because it was so much more concentric dominant and explosive in sprints and jumps and, you know, things like that which work, especially if you do it enough, you know, volume of anything is going to work eventually. <clears throat> but if I had to look at just everything I've done over the years and I had to pick, you said three, three to five. Yeah. Three to five. Um, stiff leg deadlift is going to be on there no matter what a barbell stiff leg deadlift. And, you know, as research has come out, it actually just kind of solidified that more to me. Cause as you know, so much has been put out about the stretch and the lengthened portion of a muscle being overloaded. Well, the stiff leg deadlift, I mean, that's, that's your, you know, 
the main thing you're trying to accomplish. Get into a big, deep stretch of hamstrings and overload it. Uh, if you can add a pause or even like a, like a pulse reps, like a one and a half or one and a quarter rep, it's great. So I love the stiff leg deadlift. Um, and it's nice too, cause you can do it with anything. You can do it with a trap bar. You can do it with a straight bar. You can do it with dumbbells, you know, really anything you can get in that stretch position. So that's definitely going to be there. Um, for an isolation exercise, I'm definitely going to throw the seated leg curl. Um, again, once the research on, I, I believe there's a study literally on seated versus lying. And, uh, you see that the, the seated leg curl is going to be a little bit more beneficial because you, you favor that stretch position at the top of it. I don't think that means you don't do lying leg curl or anything else, which I'm sure we'll, we'll kind of get into the nuances eventually, but, um, definitely gonna throw the seated leg curl in there. Um, I'm still going to throw sprints in, Okay, you know, and this is coming from somebody I haven't done sprints in a long time. So don't get me wrong. I'm not an, I'm not an athlete anymore. I just bodybuild, but, uh, I just love, I think it, throwing in a functional exercise is always great. And, and I'm the type of person too, where I want to, like, I mainly just train for vanity reasons. Let's be honest. It's just to look good. But if I can't do something, you know, like if I can't go golf, I can't sprint if I need to, my daughter was on her electric scooter and I was wearing flip-flops and she finally thought she could beat me to, to, we were getting the mail and I was walking. She was like, I'm going to beat you home. She finally thought she could do it. And I sprinted my ass off in those flip-flops and beat her. But if I can't do that, like, you know, what's the point right. to an extent? So I still want to throw something functional. And I think, uh, I think sprints are great. Be careful. If you're listening to this, be careful about just going out and doing sprints. You'll tear something. If you just go out there and think you can sprint a football field, no problem, but they're great for development of hamstrings and, and honestly just developing more fast switch fibers and getting stronger, more explosive, that is going to help you in bodybuilding. Even if it doesn't directly build more muscle, it's going to develop things that are going to help you build more muscle with the stiff leg and the seated leg curl. Um, and the last one I'm going to throw in uh, a glue ham raise. It's, it's, it does lengthen the hamstrings obviously, but it's very similar to a seated leg curl. It's more like a lying leg curl, I guess, because your hips are an extension, but the thing I love about it is it's very eccentric dominant. And you just like, if you do a strict glute ham raise, not the kind where you're pushing your hips back and you're, you're creating flexion at the hips or swinging back up or anything. It's just hard, man. You have to have well-developed hamstrings and strong hamstrings to be able to do a true strict glute ham raise, you know? So uh, I, I'm sure exercises are going to pop in my head as we go. And, and I'm going to wish <laughs> I threw them in here, but I would definitely say stiff leg deadlift is my number one for sure. Seated leg curl is going to be number two. Um, and then I want to throw sprints in there and then the glute ham raise okay. with strict form. I think the, one of the largest challenges with training hamstrings, and especially you talk about the, the lengthened biased work to see hypertrophy and just densification of the muscle tissue. The hardest thing is the systemic or the full body stress that's being placed with a lot of the exercises that you talked about. When we look mm -hmm. at like a stiff legged deadlift with a, a barbell and you're overloading that stretch position, the lumbar is also going to be taking, uh, the brunt of that. And then also just neurologically, it's very taxing. Like you're, you're hyping yourself up to be able to really get after a set of stiff legged deadlift. Let's say you're taking those to failure. I mean, that's going to be tremendously fatiguing. And so being able to build the hamstrings, utilizing the lengthened bias work, and this is going to apply to all muscle groups, but one ones in the lower body where we're having a taxation on multiple muscle groups throughout the lower back and so on is, is very challenging. Um, and, and the same thing goes like with the seated hamstring curl and the lying hamstring curl, where the seated hamstring curl may have more overall fatigue that someone's experiencing than the lying. And so then there's merit to both being used intelligently throughout an entire you know, program, um, which leads me into my next question for you. When you are programming for clients or you're programming for yourself, how would you utilize failure training, if at all, uh, within the program design? I, I want to, I want to mention something real quick on the point you made. Cause, and I think this is, this is the hard part about, you know, what are the, especially if you say it this way, like you said, what are my favorite versus if somebody says, what are the best? I just talked about this in a, in a podcast that went on my show and it's like anybody who says this is the best, they're full of shit because you know, it depends on the whole program. It depends on how many days a week they're trained. It depends on the person, their experience, like so many things. I think that this is what like drives me nuts when, and I think this doesn't happen as often, but you probably remember there's a lot of like old heads 
in the industry to strength guys. That's like, you just got to compound, do the compounds. Compounds are going to do everything. <laughs> and it's like, you can't, because as soon as you get strong, you can't do a ton of volume with those because it'll just smash you, you know? And this is why you have to have like a small portion. And actually Westside Barbell did this well in powerlifting, but they, the compound lift was like the smallest part of their programming. The rest was a ton of accessory work because they knew when a guy starts lifting on a squat, super heavy, you can't have the squat as your main quad development because you can't do it that often once you actually get strong, you know? Um, so to your point, even though those are my favorite, I'm going to throw in seated and lying hamstring curls and maybe some other variations of, of leg curls. If I can do them, depending on the gym setup and just having that stiff leg deadlift on one day. And that's my compound lift. And I'm not even going to regular deadlift because it, it, you know, to your point, the overall fatigue of a deadlift from the floor and the lack of isolation you get on any one muscle, it's just not a great hypertrophy exercise, which that pisses old strength coaches <laughs> off as well. Um, but I, I love that you framed it that way. Cause I think I don't want somebody to listen to this and go, cool, I'm going to have like a, a hamstring dominant day and I'm going to start with sprints. Then I'm going to do deadlifts. <laughs> then, you know what I mean? It's like, no, 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 don't do that. Yeah. Then two um, weeks later, you're finally getting to hit hamstrings again, basically. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, it, so it's such a good point. Uh, as far as the, the next question with, um, you know, implementing failure. Did you say how often, sorry, did you say how often? Yeah. Or how I mean, do we I can look it? at it as how often or how are you even implementing failure and you can kind of go through different, uh, client avatars to be more specific if you want to give that or just in general. Yeah. This is a really good question. And, um, what I have found with, you know, I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of different people because, you know, tailored coaching method, my company, it, it primarily works with gen pop. And I always call them advanced gym pop because they still like to geek out a little bit. You know, they're not just a normal person who doesn't really know the nuances. They know what RIR is, for example, whereas a regular gym pop, if you say RIR, they're probably like, what, you know, and we still get some of those, of course, but, um, but I've also, I just had a guy compete this past weekend. I have some WWE guys. So like I've kind of worked with the whole spectrum and most of the time when you work with somebody advanced, they're, they're better at going to failure, whether they understand it or not, they're better at it because it's just time spent under the bar for lack of better terms. You know, the longer you train, the more skill you have at training. And I think there really is a skill to lifting to where you're able to actually go to failure and not destroy yourself necessarily. Um, and know when that point is, whereas beginners, a lot of times they'll, say they're going to a RIR zero. They're not, they're not even close. And so the first thing I would touch on with this is teaching the client how to kind of test it and then helping them monitor it. And usually this is with videos and such, you know, um, a good example of this is having a gen pop female who you're looking at her programs and let's say they have a superset with a dumbbell bench press and a dumbbell row, and they do 10 reps of each with the same weight. I'm immediately going to go, you should be able to row more than you can press, you know? So the next week, I'll go four sets of 10 dumbbell bench, four sets of max reps with whatever the weight was they used last week, because I want them to see what their max reps are. And then I see they reported they got 20 reps with it. And it's like, Hey, we can't follow the paper. We have to follow the RIR. And this is, I, I often use ranges for reps too, because of this. And so usually I will do that a little bit as well as a, a descending RIR model. So if it's four sets, it might go RIR three, two, one, zero. If it's a compound lift, I'm probably not going to go to zero. Um, but doing that allows them to progressively go closer to failure. And if we're in this, like, let's say eight to 12 rep range, 10 to 15 rep range, whatever it is, they, they have the freedom to, to let their reps vary while keeping the load and trying to get closer to failure. And, and as you know, you could spend a whole block of training, just teaching somebody how to go to failure because they don't train hard enough. Um, and some of the technicalities of training become useless if you don't know how to train hard enough with them, you know? So for me, typically how I'm implementing it is, is trying to assess how the person trains and how close they get to failure first. And that's going to start with like, Hey, we're doing a range of reps, five to 10 reps, film this set, film your last set and, and drop it in the drive so I can see it and just assessing like, okay, was it true failure? How do they feel the next day? Like let's assess soreness and stuff like that. Um, if they need more practice with failure, then I'm going to use some of those techniques where I'm saying I'm programming max reps with a certain load, knowing how many they did last time with it, but to kind of show them, teach them and prove a point that you can go further with it. And then beyond that, using this 
three, two, one, zero, this descending RIR across the sets so that we're leaving. And actually I stole this from Brad Schoenfeld. I, when I had him on my podcast, he talked about this and I was kind of toying with it. And it was cool to hear him say it because I mean, anything he says for hypertrophy is almost like the gospel, right? So I was like, cool, I got, that's, that's perfect proof right there. Uh, and that was, a, I mean, he was on the podcast about a year ago, I think. And uh, I've been using it a ton since then. And it's taught a lot of people, like they realize where they're at. And then the next week, even though it's still three, two, one, zero RIR, they'll end up going heavier on that three RIR because they realize that by the time they went like, you know, 10 reps, 10 reps, nine reps, 15 reps, same way on their RIs I'm like, Hey, that doesn't, the math doesn't add up here. So teaching them that. And then when it comes to actually programming, so I'm, you know, we've taught this person or they're more advanced. I trust that they are truly doing the RIR. I'm typically going to use, um, if they're training strictly for muscle growth, which most of the clients we work with, that's what they want. They want fat loss or muscle growth. It's physique focused. Uh, I'm, I'm going to use failure training quite a bit on isolation exercises uh, for a few reasons. One, even when somebody gets decently good, we're online, I can't see them in person and I still don't fully trust that they're going all the way to failure. And if I give them the right, let's say templates, template or guidance of don't do X, Y, Z. They'll, they'll know when to stop if it, it is, you know, an issue. And we're doing this on lateral raises, hip abductions, bicep curls, like isolation exercises on accessory work. Let's say it's a Bulgarian split squat, a lunge, uh, something like that, or a one arm row, um, or a dumbbell press. I'm probably going to stay in that one to three RIR. So I'm getting as close as I can to failure for rows. Sometimes I will, as you know, the injury risk of failing on a dumbbell or a cable row is way lower. So I might go to failure on that. And then compound lifts, I'll do a one RAR sometimes, but usually I want to teach them how to truly, you know, stay within that like two to three range away from failure. And then we can progress that as a, as a compound lift, even if that compound lift for people listening is a leg press, it doesn't just mean bench squat deadlift, you know, a metric base lift, let's say that we're focusing on building strength in. Um, so it's kind of this range of a little bit more in the tank on those heavier, more demanding neurologically and fatiguing neurologically, as well as higher injury risk exercises on those middle ground ones, a Bulgarian split squat. The injury risk is there. The neuro neurological fatigue is there, but it's not as crazy as a leg press or a hack squat or something super big and heavy. We're going to stay in that like one to three, but usually closer to that one if hypertrophy is the goal. And then for accessory exercises, I'm going to go with, you know, zero to one, because I want them to push it to that point. And uh, the last thing I will say is it also just depends on what phase of training they're in. You know, are we, is it of high volume block? Is it a strength neurological block? Um, what, what's the split? Because if somebody's doing a push pull legs, I can go to failure on the push because it's more muscular fatigue than neurological. And they're not going to hit push again for three, you know, three to four days that's totally fine. Versus if somebody's doing an upper lower, they might be back in the gym doing a press in a couple of days. So I might lean off of it a little bit for that just to focus on recovery. Absolutely. I, the, the way that you shared that is uh, very useful. I would say for the listeners, just to be able to see the different ways to apply it. Is there a, an archetype of client that uh, it comes to you and you feel they have the perfect foundation of training to failure or training with, with great intensity. Cause I have a few things that come to mind for me and I'm curious uh, if it aligns with maybe what that archetype would be for you. Yeah. I can think of a couple uh, like clients off the top of my head. Um, one of them I, I can think of right away is this guy named uh, his, his WWE name is Chad Gable. And he had a lot of, <laughs> this is polar opposites, but it's like, do you remember dog crap training? Mm-hmm. So like dog crap meets Olympic lifting, which is not the same thing, but <laughs> he was an Olympic uh, wrestler. And so he grew up doing those. But then when he transitioned to WWE, he started kind of shifting gears a bit, but he still loved the Olympic lifts. Um, I came in into the scene for him because he had shoulder issues and he came to me. He's like, I, uh, I don't, I can't press. I can't bench ever again. I was like, that's not true, man. Let's just like start working through stuff. Um, so he's doing great. But that guy, like I had to t tell him like, dude, we got to like, there has to be a rest day. You got to calm down. So I think uh, that archetype would be uh, an ex athlete, but I, I want to make a serious point. Like I'm an ex athlete, but like I played like club select, you know, I had to try out for the team, but like I did, I was an Olympic athlete. I wasn't a college athlete. It's totally different. Let's be honest. You know, the amount of people who go from sports, you know, as a high school, like varsity high school to actual like NCAA, like college or pro or Olympic, like 
they're nine, nine different people, nine day different people, you know? So serious, serious athletes like that. I think it, it does um, go that way where you got to kind of slow them down. Um, and on the polar opposite side, it's, it's the soccer mom, Susie, you know, the person who is doing um, F45 or orange theory or anything like that in the sweat produced in the workout equals the results in their mind, you yeah. know? And so it's like, Hey, we got it. Like, it's not about short rest periods and getting a sweat on and cranking the heat up, like slow down, take a rest, go as heavy as you can. Like, I want you to drop the dumbbell when you're rowing. Cause you're going so hard. like, you got to teach them some grit and those are polar opposites, but I think it's pretty, it, it's easy to identify those things and know like, okay, I got to push this person even further to failure. And on paper, this might look reckless to somebody who's really intelligent. Cause I'm like, telling her AMRAP, go to failure all the time. But we know that person's not going to do it the same way. And for this guy, I'm telling him to leave three, four reps in the tank because I know he's not going to do that. It's going to be like one to two. Right. So you can under, you know, that's the art of coaching, I guess. You can kind of look at the two. And then I think the most difficult people are the ones that are actually in between. Yes. Who are, I would say, in, and they're probably coaches, honestly, a lot of times, because they're intelligent enough and it almost makes them overthink. Mm -hmm. You know, I think you got to be doing this long enough to not overthink it and and get to a point where you're like overanalyzing your RIR, right? Like you got to get in the gym, go hard. It's not the end of the world. If, if like, you're like, oh, I'm a little too sore today. Okay, you learn, take some notes, come back to it. Um, so I think that's probably the most difficult person, but the archetypes I can think of are the two opposites for sure. The one thing that I would add for the the person who's coming in who probably has an easier time training to failure is someone who's had experience training with someone else, like being able to be pushed by someone in person, they've been spotted, they've had that experience of having someone you know, encouraging them and saying, no, 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 you can, you can get another one, so on and so forth. I think that those individuals have a, a leg up uh, because so many people like the, the soccer mom, Susie, that you bring up, uh, they're self-taught from the internet at this point for getting into the gym ever. And that is a wild thought to me, being someone who uh, had an athletic background, played in college, so on and so forth. A lot of my base was in the team setting and being encouraged and pushed and, and told that I wasn't strong enough and so on and so forth. So I had the, you know, reinforcement there. And I think that a lot of people, um, have not had that experience. So it's, it's tough. And like you said, being able to program properly and kind of anticipate what that person's going to be doing is a huge part to their success. Low reps is best. High reps is best. Fruit is so it's good. It's terrible. You should you. lift heavy. High reps, Carbs low are weight. needed. Keto Squats are bad for your Squats are great. You for should squat ass to grass. It's fine. It that's my macro. For idiots. When there are so many mixed messages going around, it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on. But that's exactly where physique development one on one coaching comes in. You might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before, but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life into consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need. Now, getting back to hamstrings, because we've kind of gotten off on this uh, just overall intensity, which is totally fine. But getting back to hamstrings, is there any myths that you would like to debunk when it comes to hamstring training? Maybe exercises that some will say, this is for hamstrings and it's really not. Or um, I don't know, something else that may be of the topic uh, that you would want to debunk. Yeah, you know, I think this is actually one of the harder muscles to to actually debunk um, myths with, in my opinion. Um, I, I I have a couple other muscles that I almost want to give examples, but I'm not because I know you guys are going to have other people on <laughs> to talk about those muscles. Um, but with hamstrings, I think the biggest thing is actually going back to even kind of relates to one of the exercises I put in my favorite, which is the sprint. You know, I think that there's it, it's the same idea of like you only need compound lifts. Well, I think a lot of people, they've thought that with compound lifts, they've thought like that's going to, like even the squat, like people will often, you know, squat for better glutes, squat for better hamstrings, squat for better quads. And I'm like, hey, it's not a one size fits all for everybody. It's it's how you squat. It's the, you know, how how long is your torso? How long are your femurs? Like it, it changes, you know, for some people, squats are great for glutes. For other people's, it's just 100% quads, you know, but um, 
compound lifts and I would say explosive, like athletic exercises are often looked at as hamstring builders. And as you know, I said, sprints are great for hamstrings. I think there's a, you know, we can't show research that says muscle damage equals growth, but it's very hard to show anything that shows all the things that lead to muscle growth, never create muscle damage or soreness. You know, this is why like does soreness lead to growth. And it's like, well, yes and no, not directly, but indirectly, if you're not doing all the things, then, you know, you're not going to be sore. If you do the things you're going to be sore. And I say that to say, if you've never done sprints and you went through a sprint training, you'd probably build hamstring size, you know? Is it a long-term exercise that you can progress over time to continue growing your hamstrings? Probably not. But anything with that novelty stimulus is probably going to lead to some growth initially. I think that people say this often though with sprints, with kettlebell swings, um, even some people say with just the regular deadlift, which I, I disagree with. And I think that all these explosive athletic type exercises it's more likely that there was that novelty stimulus in the beginning, but those things are going to develop more faster fibers, build more strength, help you recruit more motor units quickly because you're being explosive. That carries over to hypertrophy, right? That's like somebody doing hypertrophy training and never implementing a strength block or some strength training exercises where you're lower reps, right? Or never doing anything explosive, or, you know, never doing aerobic conditioning because you're just trying to get big. All those things contribute to muscle growth indirectly, and you got to do them at some point or sprinkle them in as you go. Um, so I think that to me, that's the biggest thing is like just doing these compounds or these, you know, kettlebell swings, these explosive exercises, these functional movements, it's not going to build hamstring size. Cause you can't load that length in position. You can't really progress them over time. You know, it's, it's sprints. I mean, you can sprint faster, but that's not, it's not going to do the job. And it's one of my biggest, it, it relates to one of my biggest issues with the whole like functional bodybuilding thing. I think it's a great term. It sounds really cool. I wish I thought of it first, but like what it's represented as is like a bunch of cool exercises that seem fun. Like it's not, that's not going to work. You know, that's not like if you're, if, if you're an everyday person who needs to move better and is really, really bored with your training and maybe you're just trying to lose fat. Great. It's awesome. Like you should just be having fun. But if, if we're talking bodybuilding, like that's not, you know, that kind of stuff isn't going to do it. So I don't know. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I would say so. And, and to the the point of functional bodybuilding, I would say a majority of those who are promoting it I, from who I see are a lot of guys who were doing bodybuilding first. And yeah. now they're like, okay, I'm done with this and realize that I would like my body to feel better. Now I'm getting into this functional work. Well, now I'm still jacked from my bodybuilding work because I did 10 years of this as well as gear was uh, in place alongside of that. And yeah. now I'm going to get into the functional side. I'm going to retain a good bit of that muscle density that I worked so hard for a decade on. Um, and then people are going to be like, oh my gosh, he's doing all this functional work and he has all this muscle tissue. It's like, well, it's not a one for one correlation here. There was things that transpired beforehand that put him in the position to be able to do that. Um, not to say that there's zero muscle being gained, obviously, through the, the functional work, but um, I, I'm with you on it. And then the other thing that I would add in terms of, of myths would be things like the, the leg press training the hamstrings. Uh, people have like a very high foot placement on a leg press, and they feel as though that because they feel a sensation of, of stretch on their hamstrings that, oh my gosh, my, my hamstrings are the thing working here. And that's certainly not going to to be the case in terms of just the function in which we are going through that particular exercise. So I thought that was, was interesting. Um, now the, the next question I, I want to ask you, and this is something that I use a lot within my clients just because of time constraints. And we work with a very similar population in terms of having more of an advanced gin pop, uh, group of people. Uh, so do you have any favorite hamstring supersets, whether it be uh, opposing muscle groups or it be same muscle group? How may you use that in a client program? If you want to give a specific client, you certainly can, but I'm curious of how you use that in pairings. Yeah. Um, I love this question. And I want, I want to mention this because, I mean, it relates to what you had just had said, but I think it's going to set up my answer for this too. And, and by the way, I agree. I've said what you literally just said about functional bodybuilding so many times <laughs> and intuitive eating as well. Yeah. You know, like, cause, oh, intuitive eating is how you got that way. Cause you used to be a competitor. So I don't really understand how that works. Right. Yeah. Um, and there's quite a few of those things out there. Hybrid training is another one, which I think hybrid training is dope, but it's not going to get you big. So <laughs> anyway, 
I'm actually mapping out a podcast to do that topic with a bunch of different things. So that's going to be you good. saying that made me smile because I was like, yep, that's it. <laughs> um, you know, to your point with the leg press is what it's going to apply to kind of what I'm going to mention with the supersets too, is that the difference between a stretched muscle and a lengthened muscle, sometimes they're the same, but sometimes they're not. In your example, they're not. So people can't feel a stretch. And this is why I catch myself sometimes and try to mention the lengthened instead of stretched because anatomically it is different. And, you know, if you look at that leg press, I mean, you're more likely to get a glute stretch in that position, if anything, because you actually are taking the glute into a lengthened position. Um, and if, you know, regardless, your quads are probably going to be in a lengthened position because your knee is in flexion, but you can't really completely lengthen the hamstring without your knees in extension locked out, right? People knowing that it makes the answer to what exercises are going to create that stretch for you or that stretch in a an overloaded sense, a lengthened sense, way easier to understand. So the superset um, example is going to utilize that. And it's basically um, one of my favorites is to do some kind of shortening exercise followed by some kind of lengthening exercise. Now, for somebody who's a beginner, I might just use a literal hamstring stretch. So nothing crazy. We're doing a lying leg curl and then like sit on the floor and do a hamstring reach, you know, just stretch my intra set stretching is what it is. And it's been studied. Um, but for somebody's more intermediate advanced, we can add to that and do something like a seated or a lying, or if somebody has a machine, I really like a kneeling hamstring curl, um, same like hip position as a lying leg curl technically, but you can do a unilateral. I feel like the grip is easier. You can stand tall. You can just get into that position more, uh, better. And it's less likely for people to create a ton of extension in their lumbar. Um, so we're doing this shortening exercise where we're going through knee flexion, shortening the hamstring muscle, getting a pump, basically, um, contraction is like the main thing that you're really going to feel that movement in the shortened range, that contraction at the end. And then right after that, going immediately into something like a stiff leg deadlift or a staggered deadlift or something where you're putting the hamstring into an overloaded lengthened position. Um, I definitely would recommend going lighter at first when you do this on the, uh, lengthened exercise, the deadlift. Cause you don't want to compensate and hurt your back. Cause as you mentioned earlier, this is an exercise that is fatiguing. So if somebody, for example, has a, a heavy back squat or a deadlift at the beginning of their program, I'm probably not going to put the superset in there. Cause I just don't want to be too crazy, but there's a lot of times I will take uh, almost kind of like a West side, uh, uh, concept where they have a max every day and a dynamic effort day for hypertrophy. I might have a day where they do have some heavier lifts or a heavy compound. And then the next day is going to be a lot less of that neurologically fatiguing exercises just to prevent injury and just focus on getting volume in, but doing some kind of shortening exercise, like a, a, a leg curl variation. And then, you know, let's say 10 to 15 rep range, one to two RIR. So not going to complete failure. And then moving right into that, uh, stretched lengthened position, hamstring exercise, trying to find a variation that is really easy and safe for you to do. Um, it's hard to find one that's not going to load the lumbar, you know, cause almost every variation of a, a really overloaded lengthened hamstring position exercise is going to be some kind of hip hinge, you know, it's just what it is. So I'd rather have somebody do like a dumbbell RDL, um, or a trap bar RDL so they can load the weight at the sides of their body. And then usually what I'll do here is a little bit lighter and do some kind of like half rep at the bottom. So even if you're doing partials, you know, it's just about getting in that length and position and just repping it out in that length and position after you brought a bunch of blood flow, get a good pump in the hamstrings from a seated leg curl or any kind of leg curl. Um, so when it comes to those, that's my favorite. I, I've done things in the past with almost like a contrast training, but this is way more for power development. You know, you're doing some kind of hamstring dominant exercise followed by like a swing or a broad jump or something explosive, a hip hinge that's explosive. And that works great for athletes. But when we're talking about hypertrophy, I, I don't, I can't think of any extra superset that I like better than a leg curl with a, a hinge that stretches that muscle under load. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Th there's not very many supersets that we can really construct outside of the one that you shared uh, to hit the same muscle group uh, but the, the one thing that I would add is that if you are to do a lying hamstring curl and then go into a stiff legged deadlift, 
one thing for the listeners to keep in mind is cardiovascular health and your ability to not be sucking wind the entire time because it's the lying hamstring curl is going to be a lot of bracing and then you're going to go straight into the stiff leg which is going to also be a lot of bracing and so if you are not cardiovascularly adapt this is going to be a really challenging like you are not going to fail because of the muscle it's probably going to be the fact that you're getting lightheaded and sucking wind and you probably need to get on a treadmill and start let's let's lose a little bit of body fat let's get into better overall shape before we get into a superset like this because it can be great from a hypertrophy standpoint because this is going to allow for um, greater uh, proximity to failure uh, within both exercises especially if we're doing multiple sets um, but I find that that's a, a great tool and the partials you could also add in the Smith machine because I think the Smith machine allows for if you're able to elevate the feet because oftentimes when someone's in the bottom portion of it, an RDL um, they find themselves in a place where that bar is still hitting the bottom so if you can elevate your feet you may be able to do it a little bit easier in that just because it's a little bit more stable so on and so forth so I like that superset a lot do you um, do you think of anything that would be like opposing muscle groups or, or uh, being beneficial I'm trying to think of anything else that would fit into a, a superset that would be specific to body composition improvement, but also training the hamstrings, whether it be shortened, lengthened, anything like that. Yeah. So I will say this too. I think that I'm very unlikely to use that kind of superset with anybody who's not at least an intermediate that I feel pretty comfortable with. Absolutely. And honestly, I very rarely superset for hypertrophy with beginners, especially on leg days, you know, if it's an upper body day, push pull makes a lot of sense. It's really easy. Um, but most of the research just isn't super favorable. I think whenever you look at the context of research with this stuff, you do have to be careful only because there's the programming's not science, it's art, you know? So the, you take it with a grain of salt because there's a lot of times where you read study and you're like, well, I can out program the flaw in that study and make it more beneficial. So it depends, but I think the reality is like most leg exercises are exactly what you said. They're metabolically fatiguing, they're neurologically fatiguing, and a lot of them are lo locally like muscular fatiguing. So it's, it's hard to pair things and expect performance or volume is going to be greater because of it. It's usually going to harm it. Um, but the, the thing I do know with regards to like research favoring supersets is isolation exercises that are antagonists, right? So a leg extension and a leg curl are always a great superset for damn near any experience level because research has favored that. And I imagine it's because you're actually taking away some of that local fatigue as you do the other exercise, which increases your recovery to go to the next one. And some people, if they don't understand this, might think that's a bad thing. Cause if you do a leg curl and you get a good pump and then you go to a ham, uh, a leg extension and you're like, dang, I lost my hamstring pump. Well, that actually might help you squeeze out a couple extra reps, you know, and this is where volume and over, overall tension placed on the muscle due to the amount of reps and weights so of tonnage volume that you accomplished by the end of session is more important. So I'm very often supersetting leg extensions and leg curls. I think that's a given. It's just a great one. Um, otherwise, I think the only way you can really superset these without harming the rest of your training is like, you got to squeeze in some calf raises. Cool. Like let's superset that with it because that's easy. I see a lot of people superset abs. Um, and I think that's a mistake most of the time because you know, back to your point about bracing, almost every exercise, you know, requires some bracing, some more than others. And a lot of people are like, I'm going to throw sit-ups in between each one. And it's like, not only are you fatiguing your core, your entire trunk, which is trying to create stiffness and stability for these exercises, um, but you're going to end up lifting lighter, you know, or potentially causing an injury, depending on the exercise you're doing for your abs. So most of the time for me, it's, it's advanced individuals doing something like that, um, you know, I call it a, a shorten and then a stretch exercise, a superset, because it's just simple. And then uh, this antagonist leg extension, leg curl, I guess you could throw in like a glute ham raise or any type of leg curl really with that leg extension. Um, I don't like supersetting lunges with things usually just because again, it's, it's not the same as an isolation exercises. Neither is a hip thrust for the most part. Um, the only other thing I can think of is actually just supersetting it with the same exercise in a different variation. So maybe it positions you in a different, like, again, if we look at the lying and the seated leg curl, it does position you differently and it's going to target the hamstrings differently. It's not one that I often do really, um, ever, but you could do that, I suppose. Um, otherwise I'm just not a huge, and then anything else is it's, it just becomes a drop set. It, right. I was gonna say, you know, you can superset it with the same exercise, but 
it's not really a superset anymore. Yeah. I think to do the superset of a, a lying hamstring curl and a seated hamstring curl, you would have to be very well-versed in how to perform it, or yeah. you'd have to have a special piece of equipment that is able to bias more of a particular position. Something like a, a, pl a prime selectorized piece would probably work in that situation if you were trying to get more bang for your buck and uh, get like a short and lengthened superset as you talked about. Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing? turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one -on -one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program. Because you are awesome and I want you to have this program, I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. Now, the, the few exercises that you brought up, uh, I wanna focus on, on two. In the RDL, what is the most common error that you see clients making when they first come to you? Because this is you know, one of the big things with our, with our coaching, and I'm sure yours, is that when they first send videos, correcting exercise takes a good bit of time. And this is the one thing that really unlocks the opportunity to see real results for the first time in a lot of these individuals' lives. And so what are some of the common errors that you see when clients are performing the stiff-legged deadlift? Yeah. It's a good question, man. And it's a good statement you made there too. It's often why I'll, I'll do longer blocks in the beginning because of that reason. Like every week we're just learning, you know, it's, it's not people who get bored after three weeks. It's like, Hey, like, <laughs> you know, you're not advanced enough for us to not improve the technique, you know? And there's even people who have lifted for a long time and they're still not like, you're not an advanced lifter because you've lifted for 10 years. You're an advanced lifter. If you lift well yeah. after 10 years, you know? Um, so with regards to the, the RDL, one big mistake I see a lot of people make is it's more of the thought process really, but it's, it's mistaking the stiff leg deadlift with the Romanian deadlift because they are subtle, but they're different. And knowing what you're trying to target there is really important because the RDL is going to have more, I would say glute. Technically you would start from the rack. You can start the other one from the rack too, but you start from the rack and you're going to have a little bit more knee flexion. You're going to sit back into it. You're still going to target your hamstrings, but I would consider that more of like a, an accessory lift for the deadlift when you're trying to build strength for the deadlift. Cause it's, it's more of a hip hinge with knee flexion, like a deadlift is. Whereas a stiff leg deadlift, you're, you're, there's going to be a soft bend in your knees, but your whole focus is trying to keep your hips as high as you can and creating the biggest stretch possible in your hamstrings while loading it and controlling the movement. Um, so First, it's that thought process. Then when we move into that stiff leg deadlift, because we're talking specifically hamstrings here, I would say it's it's people just bending over. You know, I think there's like, people need to understand there's a difference between hip hinging and bending over. And a lot of times they just bend over. And so it's, it's less of a really strong like hinge at the hips and it's more rounding of the spine. And this is not me saying, because there's some people out there, it's like, you can never round your back. I don't think that's true. But- if you're bending over, you're leading with your shoulders and with your arms, right? You're leading with your upper body, whereas your hips are like the pendulum. They should be leading the movement pattern that you're going through and creating the range of motion for you. And if you do that, your back stays very neutral. Uh, all the tension is going to be in your hamstrings. The bar is going to stay very close to like a damn near sliding down your legs, literally touching because the further you let that bar drift away from your legs, the more rounding you're going to get of your upper back. And you're going to be, again, going into that bent over leaning, leading with your arms position. Um, so I think the biggest issue is, is that it's bending over. I would say a second biggest issue is these can be together, but either not bending your knees enough or bend, bending your knees too much. You know, some people think you need to lock out your knees and that's probably not going to help you at all. Um, and then some people just bend their knees too much. And now it's more of an RDL right? Um, 
And for RDLs, like you can teach that really well by just having somebody stand close enough to a wall and say, hey, I want you to touch your butt to the wall. They almost go into a perfect hinge position because they're trying to reach their butt back. They're not trying to bend over. Um, and you can teach them that before the stiff leg deadlift and then just say, okay, now we're going to scoot a little bit closer. And then when they do too much, they just hit the wall right away and they don't get that range of motion. You know, you can also tie a band around their waist and stand behind them and guide their hips either up or back. However, you need the band to pull their hips into that, uh, that fl- the amount of flexion you're after. But the biggest issues, man, I, is, is always those things. I, I see people just bending over. Then I see people either not bending their knees enough or too much. And then just the thought process between the two, stiff leg and a, a regular RDL. Um, and, and sometimes if people are just bending over or they're not understanding how to keep the bar close, I shift the dumbbells. It, the barbell is great, but if you can't get comfortable with the bar doing that, you can pack your shoulders and actually have your arms almost at like a 45 degree angle, right? So your, your, your knuckles are almost going down your legs, but kind of on the corner of the side of your legs versus in front where you see this rounded position of the scapula. I agree. The, the one tidbit that I would add is that I commonly see people creating kind of a point A to point B set up because they've seen someone else do it. So it's like, I have to get in a barbell setting. I have to get the barbell down to the floor. And yeah. for them, their legs are significantly longer and their torso is maybe shorter than especially the person that they saw doing the example. And so then they're like, my back is absolutely killing me. It's like, well, for that particular range of motion for you, it's going to be much different of how you're moving through this, what uh, muscles are, are uh, being more associated, so on and so forth. And so I always try to drive home that structurally everybody's going to look just a tad different and we have to find what's going to be best for the the individual and not look at kind of a, an a b destination you know set up for the particular exercises um stuff like this is so good because i think in today's world there's just so much online programming whether you're coaching with someone or you're just finding it online which is generally what i'm saying here or you're finding bad coaching and they don't tell you this stuff but <laughs> <laughs> to just choose the the rdl and just go with it you know I learned this really young in my career because I got, uh, at the gym I was working at, we ended up training some male volleyball players, seven foot tall, six, eight, like just massive guys. So I'm stacking three 45 pound bumper plates underneath the trap bar just to get them to do a normal, like a kind of normal range of motion. Cause they're just freakishly tall, right? Like my best friend, his name is Cody too. He, he's six, four, I'm five ten on a good day. So it's like, when we train, like we do bench press and I love it. Cause like I just have, he has an extra foot of distance to travel. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I, I don't think enough people realize that. And, and so what I typically coach is like a general, a general point, everybody's going to get to their like tibia, right, right below their knee. They're generally probably going to be able to do that safely. Some people can get all the way to the floor. Some people can create a deficit and stand on a plate or two, you know, but what you're after is that hamstring stretch. So you're just trying to feel that max stretch. And as soon as you get that, if you go any further, your hips are going to shift because you, you have to bend over to get further. So I always tell people, start light, go until your stretch, the stretch in your hamstrings is, is as tight and as maximal as possible. And then, you know, of course, at first, maybe you do have to test the waters by going a little further. That's why you go light and you feel that hip shift, right? And then you go, okay, here's my range of motion. You know, it's the same thing with squat. Like when you get that big butt wink, it's like, okay, well let's try out these different foot positions and everything. So you can see what limits that and increases your range of motion. That's your sweet spot. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm glad you added to that. And then the other exercise is the lying hamstring curl. What are some of the common errors that you see with your clients performing the lying hamstring curl? Yeah. You know, I, I, I actually program it less often than I used to just because I think it's more prone to bad technique compared to most, um, even like uh, the glue hammers, et cetera. I don't even program that very often because most people don't have it. And when they do, they don't know how to do it. You know, it's just, it's really, really hard to do it strict. So, um, but the lying, uh, one of the problems with the lying leg curl, I think is the standardization of the machine. It, it varies way more than a seated leg curl, right? A seated leg curl is pretty simple. It's in a seat, but with a lying hamstring curl. Sometimes they're one bench flat. Sometimes they're two bench with a little arc. Sometimes they have a huge arc right in the middle. Um, and then also too, I think depending on somebody's uh, pelvic tilt, it can change too. As you know, when you're training somebody, certain exercise, you have to cue even more of that, like almost like a posterior tuck where you're like bringing your tailbone to your, your belly button kind of thing, compressing the rib cage. Some people we don't have to worry about it at all. So how much do we have to correct this? You know, in the lying, uh, the lying leg curl, I find 
is more prone to those issues. Um, and a lot of times that's what I see. I see people like I've seen this a lot too, where you have the handles and you're almost, you're not looking back. I don't want to say looking back at it because that sounds <laughs> funny, but <laughs> you're kind of like in a Sphinx position. If you think of like mobility wise, and you're like arcing up almost like you don't want to be laying down with your head down, but truly most exercises, you're probably going to be safer with a neutral position of your spine, your rib cage pulled down a little bit and your head's going to be down if you're in that. So like really arching their upper back to, to stay tall or arching their low back because they keep pulling, uh, the, the leg curl forward towards the back of their head. And a lot of times that that's also, and this is the big issue there. It's either the bench is in the wrong position or the pads are in the wrong position. You know, do you put it on your heel, your Achilles, your calf? Do you need it on like the, the pit of your knee above your knee? Like people don't understand where to put it. Um, and I, and you guys are great with this cause I've seen tons of, you guys do really technical videos on this stuff, but that's, that's a simple thing, it, you know, and somebody it's not you, it's the machine. So learn how to adjust the machine properly, you know, and, and this goes for leg extension. It's the same thing. Even the backrest, you know, there's research that shows if you actually lay down and do line, uh, leg extensions, it's going to build more muscle than seated later. The stretch research came out. So it made sense. Most people can't lay down on their leg extension. So it's like, can we push it back and lean back a little bit just to like re relieve those hip flexors a little bit? So sometimes I think the biggest issue is just that just positioning the machine and the pads properly so that you're almost forced into an ideal position. I could not agree more. It, it is nine times out of 10, the issue with the equipment provider, because they make it for a massive human being. And when we're trying to get the hamstrings fully shortened, we need at least just a little bit of, of hip flexion in place. And so that's why a lot of those are set up in the way that they are to have um, that little bit of hip flexion uh, happening. And unfortunately, there is such a wide variety of setups for these lying hamstring curls. And oftentimes the uh, upper leg pad is far too big for a majority of females males. And so then they run into the situation of like, I don't feel comfortable in this. It just doesn't feel right. And one of the biggest fixes that we use in this is that we take one of those like a uh, softer hip thrust pads, like the mm -hmm. ones that go around the bar, not just the, the flat ones. Um, and we place that under their hips to create the hip flexion. And then that gives them a little bit more stability. And then that often kind of fixes that main issue. Then the other one that I commonly see is just people not stabilizing themselves, you know, pulling into the, the handles and just kind of having their hands just wherever they want them to be and thinking that they're going to have this stability. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just like resting on top of the bench and, yeah. <laughs> uh, because there's so much stability required in the lying hamstring curl. That's the, I, I would say one of, you know, a couple of different reasons why I prefer the seated over the line, because there's so much stabilization that's going to be required for the, uh, individual to be able to do just to get set up. And then with the seated, I mean, it's like you put the pad down, you make sure that your knee is in alignment with the pivot joint and you curl like that is really going to be the main base of it and so if they have the two options i'm often going to to stick with the the seated uh, over the line if, if both are available i agree man i think that a lot of people a lot of uh, people in the industry the coaches need to understand the importance of standardization and when you can choose exercises that are easier to create a a standard from session to session to session, week to week to week, even gym to gym, if somebody's traveling every once in a while. Um, I mean, this applies to diet, applies to everything. It's just so much easier, right? It, it's way better. And to your point, the lying leg curl is too much of that. And I've even seen like the arc and the pad where the, the pad split for a smaller female. And it's a, if it's a bigger machine, that could be like at her belly button, you know, yeah. or she can't reach the handles. It's <laughs> like, we got it, you know? And uh, I love your cue with even just gripping the handles. Cause I think that applies to so many exercises you know, there, even just some people telling them to crush the bar, which is such a simple thing, but on any exercise, crush the handle, you're going to create more tension. A lot of times that alignment of your joint, the stability muscles that do help your joints sit into place and stay strong and prevent injuries, all that they fire right away. You just need to create maximal tension. And a lot of people don't, especially like I, I did on camera. If people are just listening, <laughs> I put my hands under my chin. Cause you're just like laying like you're on the beach or something. No, you're on yeah. a machine, grab the handles, create tension. So yeah, this has been great. And the one thing that I would love for you to do is that if there's one thing that the listeners can take from this episode to apply to their hamstring training, what would you leave them with? 
Oh man, that's hard. Um, I believe that, I guess I would say, uh, I think this is especially true with the hamstrings. Um, simplify things, you know, like it's more exercise variations aren't necessarily better. Like if you listen to this whole podcast, we didn't name a ton of variations. You know, I think people make this mistake with glute training a lot. There's like a million variations they do with the cable machine. It's like with hamstrings, there's only so many good exercises to do. So it's better to, to really build your skill in those, the handful of great exercises, spread them out between a couple sessions each week and just focus on standardizing everything and progressing them. You know, look at your total tonnage. I thought a lot of advanced lifters this too. Like you're not going to add five pounds to the bar every time. And sometimes it might be a rep. Sometimes it might be five pounds. Sometimes it might be a set, whatever. Sometimes it might be nothing and you're just focused on skill and that's fine. But if you track your tonnage sets times reps times weight, it's easier to see progression because you can add a single rep and it adds tonnage and it's motivating. But if you just track that and stick with the same exercises, you know, of course you can vary rep ranges over time, depending on the phase. But I think people just switch up things too much, right? Create, get a few solid ones, get really, really good and proficient at those exercises and just slowly progress them over time. Don't be in a rush to change them. Don't get bored. Don't let boredom ruin your results. You know, you can like, I always tell people this, because results are really fun. Once you get some results and you see them, it's all fun because you like what you see, but you just got to be patient enough to see that first. Absolutely. I'm really glad that you shared that with everybody because it's, uh, couldn't be more accurate. Where can the listeners find you? Um, after listening to this episode, I'm sure they're going to want to check you out. Thank you, man. Yeah. Uh, Cody McBroom on Instagram and Tailored Coaching Method is a company. Tailored Life Podcast is our podcast. Uh, so really just anything tailored coaching method or, or my name on Google, it's going to pop up a ton of free content. We put out so much. So, you know, the coaching, the app, the eBooks, the podcasts, Instagram, it's all there. So just go check it out, learn for free. And, uh, I know if you like algorithms, why you guys have been on the podcast. I, if you, if you guys like this stuff, I'm sure you'll like 100%. what we put out too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, if there is a, a group of people that I would say I have such a strong overlap, it, whether it be audience or just beliefs within how we go about things, it's going to be Cody. Thank you guys so much for listening. Catch us in the next episode. Appreciate you.